we've been chewing over a different way to teach you some phrasal verbs. And it all boils down to making this podcast interesting for you so that you remember the phrasal verbs and don't clam up when you have to use them. So we've cooked up an original way to present some phrasal verbs like boil down to, chew over, clam up and cook up. And we hope it will all pan out successfully. Welcome to Aprender Inglés with Reza and Craig. I'm Reza. And my name's Craig. And with more than 50 years of teaching between us, we'll help you improve your English and take it to the next level. Well, Craig, how are you doing? I'm very hot. The weather's heating up. There's a phrasal verb we're going to look at today. The weather here in Valencia is really heating up. We're recording this in July. You're probably listening in August or after. So it's a very hot time here. How are you doing, my friend? Well, like yourself, I am heating up a bit, but I remember worse years. I remember hotter years in Valencia. Yeah, it could be worse, couldn't it? It could be worse. And one nice thing is that I'm taking a break from the conversation courses in the summer. You're taking a break from teaching. We'll be back again helping you privately in September and after with your English. So if you are interested, we'll give our email addresses at the end. Reach out, get in touch. We'll be happy to help you after we've had our summer break. So the topic for this episode is phrasal verbs with food vocabulary, but they don't actually have anything to do with food. In other words, they're idiomatic, they're idioms. So just to remind you, an idiom is when you use the words, but not in their true original literal meaning, but in another meaning. I'll give you a really obvious example. It's raining cats and dogs. Well, cats and dogs don't fall from the sky. We know that. But by saying it's raining cats and dogs, it's a way of saying it's raining a lot. But there are no cats and dogs involved. That's an idiom. So all of these phrasal verbs we're going to tell you about today are being used idiomatically, not in their original true meaning. And you may have noticed in the introduction, Reza used quite a few phrasal verbs. The first one he used had the verb to chew, C-H-E-W, which is when you eat food. You put food in your mouth and you use your teeth to chew the food, especially if it's something like meat that's not easy to break up. So you need to chew your food well before you swallow it, before it goes into your stomach. Now, and an idiomatic meaning with over, to chew over, means to think about something carefully and for a long time before you make a decision. And as Reza said at the beginning, we've been chewing over a different way to teach you phrasal verbs. We've been thinking about it for a long time, to chew over. The next phrasal verb we got for you is heat up. So obviously, if food becomes cold, uh, but you want it hot, you can you can heat it up. Or indeed, as Craig said earlier, the weather is getting hotter. It's heating up. So to heat up can literally mean to make something hotter. But of course, it has an idiomatic meaning as well, which is to become more active or, or more intense or even angrier. For example, our conversation started to heat up when he accused me of being dishonest. So that heated me up. That made me angry. Yeah, the conversation heated up. Reza and I have been quite interested in the European football competition recently because Spain and England have been doing really well. So we could also say that the competition is really heating up among the top teams. It's getting very competitive. The opposite of heat up is cool down. So 
cool is like cold, but not as extreme. So it's cooling down. It's becoming calmer after a tense experience. For example, if people lose their temper, they get very angry. It's a good idea for them to cool down, calm down, take it easy. Hey, let's cool down for a second and talk this over. Let's cool down. Another phrasal verb related to heat is to boil over. So to boil in its literal sense means when water uh, it reaches 100 degrees and it can't get any hotter, it's boiling. And if you're cooking something and it boils over, that means that the water boils so much that it will come out of the saucepan or the, the container where you have it. It will actually come out over the top. And of course, that's a big problem if it boils over. So idiomatically, the phrase of verb to boil over means to lose your temper or self-control. A bit like that hot water coming out of the container. It's, it's, it can't be controlled anymore. So if you boil over, you've lost your temper. You've lost self-control. For example, tensions finally boiled over and a fight broke out. Another phrasal verb with the verb to boil is to boil down to. It's a three-word phrasal verb. So boil down to, which means to be the main reason or the cause for something. For example, next month I'll be starting more conversation groups online to improve your fluency. Reza, ask me how many students I'll have. How many students will you have, Craig? Well, it all boils down to how many students are interested in doing the course. So at the end of the day, the main reason for this, how many people, it boils down to how many students are interested in joining the groups. That's how many students I will have. That's what it will boil down to. That's the bottom line. And exactly what are your courses going to be? General conversation. But it obviously boils down to what the students want and what the students need. So if many people in the groups are interested in travel, for example, then we'll speak a lot about holidays and travel. So it boils down to what the students want from the course. They'll be the reason. They'll be the, the thing which shapes the content. Exactly. Now, an object which you can boil, well, you can boil lots of things, but you can boil an egg, something which I, I like very much. Do you like boiled eggs, Craig? Do you like eggs in general? I like eggs. But I, not boiled. I don't mind boiled eggs. I prefer scrambled or an omelette. But yeah, I eat boiled eggs. They're okay. In a salad in the summer. Oh, yes. Yeah. I like a, I like a nice boiled egg cut up in a salad. Well, the word egg then is obviously a noun. That is that thing that you can eat in a salad, for example. But it can also be a verb when it's the phrasal verb to egg on. So that's e double g egg plus the preposition on to egg on. And it means to encourage someone to do something risky or foolish. Imagine, for example, I noticed that Craig perhaps had drunk a little bit more than he should have, and he's beginning to, to play around, to do silly things. And I say, oh, be careful, Craig. Your trousers might fall down. And he says, oh, I don't care. And I say, okay, then, go on. Pull your trousers down <laughs> in public. And I'm, I'm hoping for a laugh he might do it. I'm egging him on. He shouldn't really do it. It's not a good idea. It's a bit foolish. But I'm, I'm trying to get him to do it. So I say, go on, Craig. Yeah, pull your trousers down. Let's see the moon there. Go on. I'm egging him on to do it. Yeah, I wouldn't have exposed my private parts to the policeman if Reza hadn't egged me on. Although, curiously, it doesn't come from egg. I thought it did. But it actually comes from a verb, egede which has been in the English language since 1200. And it's originally from an old Norse word, egja, which means to provoke or incite. So it's not actually from the egg, but it's a good way to remember it. If you think of an egg, you're throwing an egg at someone, you're egging them on, you're encouraging them to do something that's a little bit mischievous or naughty or bad.
Now, Craig, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Oh, that age-old question. I don't know. But there is a phrasal verb with chicken that we can use, isn't there? Chicken out. What does that mean if you chicken out? So a chicken, that's the animal which uh, lays the egg. Well, specifically, if it's the hen, the female. So chicken, C-H-I-C-K-E-N, plus the preposition out, means to decide not to do something because of fear, because you're frightened, or you simply lack the courage. For example, imagine my workmate is unhappy at work because she doesn't get much money, so she wanted to ask for a raise for more money, but she chickened out during the meeting. She didn't ask. She said, oh, I'm, I'm going to ask the boss. I, I want money, more money. This isn't fair. But, you know, the boss is very tough and she didn't want to make him angry. So she, she didn't ask him. She chickened out. And then maybe after the meeting, maybe I went up to her and I went. I made a chicken noise. Quite often we make the noise of a chicken when we're saying to someone, ah, you've chickened out. We'll quite often accompany it with the noise. And there's an interesting idiom that means something very similar to get cold feet. That doesn't mean you literally have cold feet. That means that you chicken out. You, d you don't do something that you maybe had intended to do. Do you remember when Elon Musk was going to fight Zuckerberg from Facebook? Mark Zuckerberg. Physically fight? In a cage fighting competition. MMA, really? mixed martial arts. They were going to fight each other. They were egging each other on. Really? And I then guess who chickened out? Hmm. I would have thought uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Did he chicken out? No, because he does martial arts. Oh, right. <laughs> it was Elon <laughs> Musk who chickened out and decided not to fight. Yeah, did, it was a big thing online. They were going to fight each other. Did Elon Musk know beforehand that that uh, Mark Zuckerberg could do martial arts? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. That, he knew. That's why he challenged him. I can't remember how it started. I think Elon Musk instigated it, which means he started it. I think, but then it developed into this Twitter online conversation, and eventually, well, they were egging each other on to fight, and Mark Zuckerberg said, "Yep." Yeah, you choose the day, I'm there, I'll do it. And eventually Elon Musk chickened out. Very different styles they have, don't they? It's weird, they have a lot in common. You know, they're, uh, they're people who through internet originally, but then in the case of Elon Musk, other areas have become very influential. But their style, the way they do things is so different. Elon Musk likes to, you know, be the center of attention and be be in the news. Zuckerberg, although he's such an important man, he kind of avoids publicity as much as he can, don't you think? Well, there's one thing that Elon Musk doesn't often do. He doesn't clam up. Oh, that's for sure. What does that mean? Yeah, he may chicken out occasionally, but he doesn't clam up. Not very often. Not often, no. So a clam is a shellfish. It's uh, a mollusk, if you like, a shellfish. You can eat it. Uh, so you have to open it up, first of all. Open up the, the shell, the hard shell. And inside, you'll find the, the meaty clam, the bit that you can eat. But of course, clams open and close. I don't know exactly what causes them to open or close, but I know that they, they do. So, I think it's danger when they feel threatened. When ah. they, they, you know, imagine they're in a, a big tank in the restaurant and the waiters walking by and <laughs> get very nervous that they're going to be eaten they will Don't clam them. up they will shut they will close because they sense danger they know that somebody wants to eat the, exactly. the meaty bit inside yeah that makes perfect sense so idiomatically then if a person clams up if i say he clammed up that means he didn't want to talk anymore and as craig has just explained it's probably because he was nervous or frightened. That's when people tend to clam up when they, they don't know what to say or they're embarrassed or they're nervous or frightened of the consequences. That's when they clam up. They stop talking. What do you do when your students clam up? I try to encourage them, but if that doesn't work, 
Uh, if they're in a group, then I, I ignore them for a while and come back to them if they're in a group. Yeah, because I don't want to make them too nervous. But of course, if it's one-to-one, you just have to be really patient. And um, maybe I do the talking until I can persuade them to open up again. Like a clam. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. What, what, what about you? Have, have you got any good tips to, to stop students clamming up? What you said just then, and also I like silence because some people feel uncomfortable with silence. So if I ask a question, it's very tempting for a teacher to not leave too much silence or response time. But if you ask a question and the student doesn't say anything, just wait, just sit in the silence. And very often the student will say something because silence for some people is uncomfortable. That, that's a really good tip. And uh, Teachers don't like to do that. Teachers think, oh, the, the student's not speaking. I have to speak. Well, no, just wait. Reza, have you ever been in a bar fight in a place where people are punching and hitting each other, throwing glasses and chairs? Not in a fight, no, but one incident did happen once in, in Belfast. I'm not exactly sure what caused it. Some kind of misunderstanding I think my, my, my brother was standing in the path of someone. He didn't realize he was. And this person didn't like it. And they threw a glass at him. And uh, my, my brother used to be the captain of the local cricket team. He caught the glass in his hand without any trouble whatsoever. It was quite funny, actually. Amazing reflexes. I was well impressed with his reflexes. And I think the guy who threw the glass was also so amazed he didn't quite know how to follow it up. He clammed up. Uh, I think he was he was looking forward to a big argument, but he just thought, wow, that was one hell of a catch. <laughs> and he climbed up. That's the closest I've got to a bar fight. But it didn't become physical. Strange, isn't it? Yeah. Well, the reason I asked the question is that I used to work in a bar. And I can remember one time there was a really bad bar fight in the pub. Glasses were flying. Chairs were being thrown. People were hitting each other. Guess what I did? Did you run away? No, I ducked down behind the bar. To duck down, now duck is a bird. You can eat it. If you're a Spanish speaker, it's pato. What does duck down mean? So when this bar fight broke out, Craig didn't want to get hit by the flying glass. So he ducked down. So the word down is relevant. He put his head and his body as well, under the counter, under the bit of the bar where they put the drinks when they filled him, he put his head and his body below that so that the flying glasses wouldn't hit him. He ducked down. So that's another phrasal verb from food, to duck down, to duck down behind a wall, to duck down behind a, under a table or behind a table, to duck down behind the bar so that you are not being seen. Our next phrasal verb has something to do with vegetables. It's veg out, V-E-G out, to veg out. Reza, when was the last time you vegged out on the sofa and watched a movie? Yesterday. Uh, <laughs> long ago. After the pub. <laughs> and, uh, no, before the pub, actually. After the pub, I went straight to bed. Before the pub, I had a bit of time to kill... We went to the pub together to watch a football match, by the way. And the next football match will, will be the, the England-Spain final. You may have seen it uh, already because, remember, we record these podcasts in advance. Congratulations, Spain, for winning. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're guessing in advance that Spain have won. The great thing is if Spain win, we're happy for Spain. If England win, we're happy for, for England. We can't lose, can we? No. No, we can't lose. <laughs> so we're recording this podcast just after England have won their semi-final against Holland, but before the big final of the European Cup between Spain and England. So yesterday we went to we went to the pub to to watch the match. But before that, because I had a little bit of time to kill, I vegged out. It's difficult to say, isn't it? Vegged. To veg and then to make it the 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 past or past participle vegged. I vegged out. In other words, I put on a movie on Netflix. I sat down, had a cup of tea, put on the air con and just took it easy. 
we said before, the phrasal verb to egg on goes right back to the years 1200. So it's quite a few hundred years old. However, veg out, surprisingly, is very modern. It's from the 1970s, the 1980s. It was famously said in Pretty Woman when Julie Roberts said, I'm going to veg out on the sofa. Couch potato is a similar expression when you're sitting on your sofa, on your couch, maybe eating ice cream or your favorite snack, watching the TV, being lazy. That is vegging out. But wouldn't you say, though, that a couch potato is more, uh, it has definitely negative implications. If you say a person is a couch potato, it's like saying they're always vegging out. They're really lazy. But you can you can veg out once in a while. I don't veg out every day. I, I did yesterday, but I'm not a couch potato. I don't veg out every day of my life. Wouldn't you say they're a little bit, there's a slightly different use? Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, that's that's true, for sure. Let's take a quick break here because I know you listen to this podcast to take your English to the next level. But what about your speaking? Is your fluency improving? Are you happy with your speaking skills? My conversation course focuses on making you a more confident and more fluent English speaker. You'll join me and a small group of motivated students and we'll meet on Zoom and have topical discussions, role plays, debates and presentations that will expand your vocabulary and help you express yourself effectively in English. So be proactive and take the first step towards becoming a confident and fluent English speaker. Send me an email today to craig at englishpodcast.com and I'll send you details of the next online conversation course. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Craig, have I told you that you're looking great today? That's very nice of you. Why are you buttering me up? Uh, what do you want from me? I've heard that there may be uh, lunch in the offing. That means there's a possibility of lunch at your house. Is don't right? don't get too excited because I cooked today. So you might want to have uh, a snack and <laughs> sit on the couch and <laughs> eat a potato before you have lunch. Butter is commonly put on bread if you're British. I know Spanish like olive oil on your bread. We like butter. And to butter up is to flatter someone. F-L-A-T-T-E-R, which means to pay them compliments, as Reza did, to say good things about someone. And we do that usually because we want something in return. So when was the last time someone buttered you up, Reza? Oh, a few weeks ago, a student buttered me up. They were telling me what a great teacher I was, but they hadn't seemed that interested in the classes before. They said, oh, you're a great teacher, really good. I love your teaching, blah, blah, blah. I know the course has finished, they said afterwards, but I have 25 pieces of writing to correct. You're a fantastic teacher, uh, as I said. Would you correct them for me? <laughs> That's what they were doing. They were buttering me up getting me ready to do all their corrections. Maybe I, they didn't really think I was such a good teacher, but I fell for it because, you know, who doesn't like flattery? Flattery will get you everywhere. That's true. Now, when you eat food, you use a knife and a fork, F-O-R-K. The phrasal verb to fork out, however, means to pay for something maybe for an expensive meal, but usually reluctantly. Like you don't really want to do it, but you take the money anyway to pay for something, to fork out for someone's present at work who you don't really know. And okay, we need to buy them something, but yeah, I'll, I'll fork out to pay for the present you're going to buy. So to pay for something, but reluctantly. And interestingly, it's not actually connected to the fork that we use to eat with. Because when I checked online, it goes back to the mid-19th century. 
fork is actually slang for a pickpocket. Oh. Someone who takes money out of your pocket. So that's the origin of the word, a fork, someone who steals money from you. So imagine the, the pickpocket taking the money with two fingers very carefully out of your pocket. It's not money that you really want to spend on something. It's money that you kind of have to spend on something. So you fork out, you pay the money to buy something. Now, Craig, you might be cooking the meal today, you said, after the podcast. You might. We don't know for sure. But when was the last time you cooked up a clever plan? When have you last cooked up something? I don't remember ever cooking up a clever plan. <laughs> have you ever cooked up a bad plan? <laughs> I've cooked up many bad plans that don't pan out. We've got that phrasal verb coming up soon. So, yeah, to cook up a plan is to think of a plan, to invent it, to scheme and think of a clever way to do something is to cook up a plan or cook up a strategy to do something. I would guess that many languages have a similar idiomatic use with cook. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, it's simply cocinar. It's the same word. ¿Qué está cocinando este? Like, what's he cooking up? If you're talking about food, it would be he's in the kitchen. What's he cooking? But if it's like, oh, I don't trust him. ¿Qué está cocinando? That's when we say, what's he cooking up? He's got a plan. So it's exactly the same word in Spanish. But in English, we add the preposition, cook up, when it refers to a plan rather than just cook. Without the preposition, that's for the kitchen. Another phrasal verb with up is to whip up. W-H-I-P. A whip is something that you can use to hit a horse if you want the horse to run faster, for example. Or if you want to punish someone. Years ago, they used to whip people on the back. But if you're cooking in the kitchen, you sometimes whip up some cream or whip up some particular food with a food mixer. So to whip up means to prepare something quickly or to incite a special feeling in other people. For example, the politicians tried to whip up patriotic support for their plans. And if Reza comes around to eat and I haven't prepared anything, I might say to him, Reza, do you want me to whip up a quick sandwich? Which means to prepare it quickly. Craig, have you noticed my, my new shorts? Um, yeah, they're uh, very attractive, actually. Where did you get them? Oh, I, uh, I can't remember now. It, it doesn't really matter. I like the colour. Very nice. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Did they you, make you look slimmer. You haven't said anything about my hair. It was, it was really long the last time we met. It was pretty I short. I know. Yeah, I like that haircut. Oh, it suits yeah. you. It looks oh. very, very nice. Oh, yeah. thanks. Yeah. I think Reza is fishing for a compliment. He's looking for me to say something nice about his shorts, something nice about his hair. He's fishing for for compliments in a similar way that you go fishing to catch a fish. Reza is trying to catch or get some compliments from me. In other words, I want Craig to butter me up. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite. If you fish for a compliment, you want the other person to say things that are nice. You want them to butter you up. You're fishing for compliments and they're going to butter you up. If you're in the kitchen, you might want to make a cake, a nice chocolate cake, for example, and you put it in the oven. Why? Because you want to bake it, B-A-K-E. And the phrasal verb to bake something in means to include it from the very beginning. If something's baked in, it's already there. For example, Microsoft's new operating system has AI, artificial intelligence, baked in. It's an integral part of their software. It's in there from the beginning. It's baked in software. A phrasal verb which Craig used earlier was pan, P-A-N, out. Pan out. And it means to complete successfully or to end well eventually. For example, imagine I've been studying hard I've done an exam and I failed, such as my C1 Valencian exam. You didn't fail, you, you passed. Well, I didn't the first time. The first time I failed, but I studied a bit more. 
I failed again. <laughs> I practiced a lot. And eventually I passed. Third time lucky. So it all panned out in the end. And I think we should call attention to this because we haven't said this on the podcast before. And I don't think you're fishing for a compliment. Reza has passed his C1 Valenciano exam. He is a C1 guy. And we need to congratulate him as we congratulate all of you who send us messages to say you've passed an exam. So come on, let's hear it for Reza. Gracias. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Reza, how do you think this podcast has panned out today? I think it's panned out pretty well. In other words, the ending, really, all in all, on balance, is good. It's panned out well. Now, Craig, there's the Spanish word el pan, which is bread. There's the English word frying pan, where you cook things in oil. Does pan out come from one of those? Originally, no. Originally, it comes from people looking for gold. The prospectors that went to the Wild West, for example, and they had a pan, a big, narrow, thin thing with holes that they used to go in the middle of the river, perhaps, and then with water try and find these small pieces of gold. So they were panning for gold, and the thing they used was a pan. And that's where the expression to pan out comes from. So eventually, after a lot of effort and whenever all the work was done, they had the gold in the end. So the, the end result was good, right? Once they got the gold. Yeah, and I agree with you. We're not fishing for compliments, but we do think that this episode panned out quite well. But now it's your turn to practice your English. Why don't you send us a message and give us some ideas for a future podcast? You can do that by voice, which we prefer. Go to speakpipe.com, S-P-E-A-K-P-I-P-E dot com slash English podcast. Emails, Reza? If you'd prefer to write, send an email to craig at inglespodcast.com or belfastreza at gmail.com. And if you're a Spanish speaker and you want to study with paid courses, why not visit the Mansion Inglés store? You can do that by going to store, S-T-O-R-E dot mansioningles.net. As always, we'd like to I would say a big thank you to all our supporters through Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And how they support us is by donating. It can be as little as $1.50 per month. And as a way of saying thank you to those sponsors for their donation, we give them instant access to the audio transcriptions of the podcast. If you're interested in becoming a Patreon supporter, there's a link in the show notes. It's patreon.com slash podcast. As I say, we'd like to thank every single supporter, but we haven't got time to say everyone's name. So as usual, we will just mention the most recent supporters who've joined us this month. Who are we talking about, Craig? Just one very kind person joining this month, Jessica Negria. I think that's the pronunciation. I'm sorry, Jessica, if I've mispronounced that. Jessica Negria, thank you very much for your support and thank you to everybody who is helping to keep this podcast going. Next week, we're speaking about bullying. Join us for that, a very important topic that needs to be discussed. We haven't spoken about it before. If you enjoyed this podcast this week, please tell someone so that more people can listen to us. The music in this week's episode is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. Have a wonderful week. Until next time, it's goodbye from me. And it's bye-bye from me.